All right, today I'd like to talk to you about no hope for the hardened heart. Some very interesting things here in the scriptures that we're going to look at today. Um, John chapter 12 is where we're going to start out. You want to turn your King James Bible to John chapter 12. Now the Bible talks about this thing of people hardening their hearts and actually God hardening people's hearts as well. We're going to see about that in today's study. John chapter 12, beginning in verse 23. We'll read down through to the end of the chapter because there's a lot of things that tie into what I'm going to be speaking on today. John chapter 12, verse 23. And Jesus answered them, saying, The hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. He that loveth his life shall lose it, and he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. If any man serve me, let him follow me, and where I am, uh, there, shall my, there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my father honor. Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this cause came I unto this hour. Father, glorify thy name. Then came there a voice from heaven, saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. The people therefore that stood by and heard it said that it thundered. Others said an angel spake to him. I believe the lost said that they, they hear it. It sounds like thunder to them. But the, the people that are saved, they say it's an angel speaking to him. Verse 30, Jesus answered and said, This voice came not because of me, but for your sakes. Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. This he said, signifying what death he should die. He knew he was going to die on the cross, and that's what he's prophesying. It's prophesied in the Old Testament. And it's so interesting because you'll get this heresy that's taught where they say people were saved in the Old Testament by looking forward to the cross. That's nonsense. Absolute nonsense. The prophecies are there in the Old Testament about Jesus coming and dying on the cross. They're there. But people weren't saved that way, right? That's why his disciples, a lot of times, they didn't understand what he was saying. And he'd tell them, he'd flat out tell them, I'm going to be crucified and everything. And they'd say, no, be it far from thee. They didn't understand it. Verse 34, the people answered him, we have heard out of the law that Christ abideth forever. And how sayest thou, the son of man must be lifted up? Who is this son of man? They don't even know who he is. Then Jesus said unto them, Yet a little while is the light with you. Walk while ye have the light, lest darkness come upon you. For he that walketh in darkness knoweth not whither he goeth. How many people out there right now lost people? And if you are watching this and you're not saved, you're walking in darkness. Lost people walk in darkness all the time. They have no idea what's going on in the world. They have no idea about the truth, the reality of the, what this world really is. No clue at all. They're walking in darkness. Verse 36. While ye have light, believe in the light, that ye may be the children of light. These things spake Jesus, and departed, and did hide himself from them. Hmm. Just going to give a little bit of a spoiler here about this study. Can you get to a point where God will hide himself from you? Where salvation will no longer be available to you? Hmm. We'll talk about that as we continue through this study. Verse 37. But though he had done so many miracles before them, yet they believed not on him. You know, it's kind of an interesting thing because Jesus Christ, he's physically present there on the earth and he's doing actual miracles, healing people, causing the maimed to be whole. In other words, people had lost their arms and he touched their arm and it would grow a new arm. You'd think that people would say, this guy has to be God. And yet there were people that saw it and still denied him, saw it and still rejected him. Just like a lot of people out there, a lot of lost people out there, they can look at the complexity of nature and they can say, wow, it's so amazing, it's so beautiful, there's such order and design in the universe and order and design in nature and how everything just is interconnected and works all together. I don't think that there is a God. <laughs> what? People are crazy. Uh, verse 38, that the saying of Isaiah, the prophet, might be fulfilled, which he spake, Lord, who hath believed our report, and to whom hath the arm of the Lord been revealed? 
Therefore they could not believe, because that Isaiah said again, He hath blinded their eyes and hardened their heart, that they should not see with their eyes, nor understand with their heart, and be converted, and I should heal them. These things said Isaiah when he saw his glory and spake of him. Nevertheless, among the chief rulers also many believed on him, but because of the Pharisees they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue, for they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. Well, I do believe that there's, you know, God exists, and I do believe that Jesus died on the cross. I do believe this King James Bible, but if I said anything about that, I'd probably lose my job or my family, certainly my friends. Coward. Just like the people back then. A lot of them are saying, I think he is God, but boy, I just can't, uh, I can't live for him. Can't truly put my faith in him because uh, I'll get kicked out of church. And understand that organized religion, uh, organized religion controls everything about you. Your birth, do a special little christening and Godfather, Godmother, and, and all the little baby infant baptism things and, and dedication of the baby up there in the front of the church and everything. Birth, through your Sunday schooling, schooling, no basis in scripture at all for that. Going up through, you have your youth group. Then you meet that pretty girl there and you get married. That's done at the church. Now, by the power invested in me, by the state of wherever your church is at, I now pronounce you man and wife. By the power invested in me, by the state. Hmm, that's an issue. And then you have your own children. And then they get dedicated and whatever in that church building. And then you go grow older and eventually your funeral happens there at the church. So a lot of people are afraid to leave organized religion because it's basically their whole life. Everything's tied into it. Hmm. I'd believe in Jesus, but that would mean that I'd have to leave my church family. I, I don't know if I could do that. Uh-huh. Verse 44. Jesus cried and said, He that believeth on me believeth not on me, but on him that sent me. Who sent Jesus? The Father. Talked about that earlier. And look at verse 45. And he that seeth me seeth him that sent me. Well, either they were identical twins, or Jesus Christ is saying, I am 100% fully God. And understand, you say, well, then there's no difference. Oh, yeah, there's, yes, there's a difference between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Just as there's a difference between body, uh, your body, your soul, and your spirit. There is difference there. But they're one and the same being. They're one person. There's not three persons in God. Just one. That's what the Bible teaches. Somebody says, well, there's three persons in the most holy trinity. They've strayed from scripture. But, you, you know, Jesus never said, I am the Father. Well, what do you think he's saying right there? <laughs> you know, he that seeth me seeth him that sent me. That statement doesn't even make sense if you're a Trinitarian. It doesn't make a bit of sense. Jesus is the Father. Okay, they're one and the same being. Right now, he's separate in terms of Jesus is the body, the Father is the soul. They're separate that way, but they're the same being. They're not identical twins, okay? <laughs> Verse 46, I am come a light into the world that whosoever believeth on me should not abide in darkness. And if any man hear my words and believe not, I judge him not. For I came not to judge the world, but to save the world. He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words, written words, hath one that judgeth him. The word which, that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. For I have not spoken of myself, but the Father which sent me. Remember there in verse 44 and verse 45, the Father which sent me. He that seeth me, seeth him that sent me. <laughs> Talking about the Father. Uh, the, the Father which sent me, he gave me a commandment, what I should say and what I should speak. And I know that his commandment is life everlasting. Whatsoever I speak, therefore, even as the Father said unto me, so I speak. So, Here's how this whole thing works. You say, well, there's a lot of scriptures there and things that we went over. Sure. Let me just break this thing down for you. Here's how it works. God hath given us a God has given us a record of his son. It's this book right here. 
This book is the most fought over book in the entire history of man. The most disputed, the most rejected, the most hated, the most studied, the most written about. I mean, look at all these books behind me. You know, these are mostly Bibles here, but down here, over here, you know, over that way and everything. All written about one book? What kind of a book is this? The most printed, most published book in the history of man. King James Version. Why? You see, God wrote this as an owner's manual, an instruction manual. And so you can say, well, I, how could I reject Jesus Christ? I don't see him. You know, I don't, I don't know where he is. I never met him in person. Um, but if you reject this book, if re you reject the gospel, the good news of how to be saved, you reject it. That's a problem. And when you reject that, you get to a certain point where I believe God will harden your heart and you're finished. You say, have, a, have you ever met anybody like that? Yes, I have. And I'll talk about that later on. But you say, you know, being dispensational, but you'll get run into the, I'm dispensational, but you'll run into hyper dispensationalists and they say you just reject anything in the Gospels. Um, well, you know, that's not written to Christians. This is before Jesus died on the cross. That's correct. So technically, doctrinally, it's in the Old Testament. That is correct. Um, then we can just ignore it today. Well, if there's no precedent for this in the Pauline epistles, then you could say, well, technically it is written to Old Testament. But we'll see about that. But before we go to the Pauline epistles, let's go to the book of Hebrews. And I'll show you something about the Old Testament and the thing of the hardened heart. You know, you read back through the Old Testament a lot of times and, and God's just, you know, his own people, the children of Israel, and he's just wiping them out and sending in plagues and open up the earth and they fall down in there and he's kill them and everything else. Why? Because they harden their hearts. They reject his word. So the Lord has no choice. Let's see about this. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 7. Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith, today if ye will hear his voice, harden not your hearts, as in the provocation in the day of temptation in the wilderness, when your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works forty years, leaving Egypt, and they're heading out there to the promised land, for forty years they're seeing the Lord work and perform miracle after miracle, and yet they still rejected him. Just like Jesus is on the earth and he's performing all these miracles, healing people, giving, restoring sight to the blind, raising Lazarus from the dead, all the things that he did, everything, and they still rejected him. Why? It's a sin problem. And if you have a sin problem and you reject the Lord, you can get to a point where you harden your heart. What happened? Verse 10, Wherefore I was grieved with that generation and said, They do always err in their heart, and they have not known my ways. So I swear in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. Take heed, brethren, it's a warning, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily while it is called a day, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of Sin. What causes the hardened heart? The deceitfulness of sin. Hey, you hear that uh, gospel of salvation for the first time. Oh, I don't know. I don't know if I'm ready yet. I don't know. Because they know it's going to mean a changed life. They understand, hey, some things are going to happen to me here. If I become a Christian, that means I have to stop doing a bunch of things. People know that. That's why they say, no, thank you. I don't, no, I'm not ready. I don't have the right feeling. I just... It's the deceitfulness of sin that will harden the heart. Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17. This I say, you say there's no Paul on epistle stuff? Well, let's read. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that ye walk, henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind, 
having the understanding darkened, being alienated, alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. Blindness of their heart? Hmm, almost sounds like the hardening of their heart. Who being past feeling, past feeling, no longer bothers you. You've heard the gospel so many times and you reject it because of the deceitfulness of sin. People can get to the point of being past feeling. Have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness. But ye have not so learned Christ. If so be that ye have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus. Okay, now here's somebody that gets saved. Oh, there's no conditions when you get saved. You just kind of get saved. You go on living however, you know. I believe Jesus died for me on the cross. Boom, done. Okay, back to the normal life that I once had. Oh, no. <laughs> no, no. Let's read. Verse 22. That ye put off concerning the former conversation the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. And that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Be ye angry, and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath, neither give place to the devil. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands the thing which is good that he may have to give to him that needeth. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister unto grace unto the hearers. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the, unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Are you kidding me? I have to do all of these things? Well, they're just suggestions. You don't really have... I didn't see any suggestions. If you want to, you don't really have to. It's a good idea, but you don't need to. They're all commands. Every single one of those. You go down from, from uh, let's see where it would be, verse 22 through verse 32. Yeah, 22 to 32. That should be easy to remember. Command, command, command. You have to change. And what happens if you don't? Well, uh, if you pr pretend that you got saved and whatever else, and then there's no change, well, it didn't take. I'll tell you that much right up front. But uh, um, most lost people look at that list there. They understand that list. They might not understand everything in there about all that would have to happen when they get saved. But they understand that there's going to be a change. I mean, think about just the simple logical thing here. Here I am. I walk up and I see the cross, we'll say, in my mind. I see it. There's Jesus dying on the cross. He died for my sin. My what? My sin. What's that? You're lying, you're stealing, you're cheating, your profanity, your your dirty, perverted thoughts, your and you go down through the list. Oh, wow, he died for all that? Oh man, that's terrible. Well, uh, I believe he died. I do believe that he died for me. So I guess I'll accept that and not feel bad about the fact that he had to die for what I've done, and then I'll just continue doing the things that I was doing before. <laughs> I mean, it boggles the mind how somebody could think that, unless they're so depraved and so wicked that they, they try to claim to be saved when they're not. <laughs> Christians struggle with sin, but they don't defend their sin. But uh, there you basically are seeing it. And you see a whole lot of commandments right there that are written to a Christian. Here's the way you, you will live. Uh, and if you don't, God's going to chasten you. God's going to do some things to you to hurt you. Okay? Again, I can say I have, I have uh, experienced that. Where you don't start to do right and whatever else, and the Lord will start whipping you. But you see, this is so repulsive to the modern Christian. Oh, I just want to, I, I believe in Jesus. Oh, Jesus is so wonderful and everything else and things. Hey, what about a God that would say, you're so wicked, you're so sinful, you've rejected me, you've rejected the gospel, I'm going to harden your heart. 
Your heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. Mm -hmm. How about a God like that? It's not one that modern Christians want. 1 Timothy chapter 4. First Timothy chapter, First Timothy chapter four verses one through three, a very famous passage of scripture that I quote quite a bit because we are in the latter times. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, Forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. Um, I think searing your conscience would kind of fall under sort of the same category as hardening your heart. Uh, I know it's not spelled the exact same way, but I don't think you can say, well, I have a nice soft heart and I'm willing to listen to the Lord, but I have seared my conscience. Uh, no, the two are tied into it to each other understanding things from the heart and whatever else it's, it's your like your conscience there and you know, I mean you could make all the arguments you want there but the whole point is somebody that's seared their conscience they have a heart problem don't tell me that they don't but you see people are departing from the faith there are a lot of people here in in this country that were raised understanding biblical concepts and precepts and now they're starting to just sear their conscience they're hardening their hearts through the deceitfulness of sin. Hmm. Second Corinthians chapter six. I'm going to give you some practical application for this, both if you're lost and if you're saved when dealing with people. Second Corinthians chapter six, verse one. We then as workers together with him beseech you also that ye receive not the grace of God in vain. Um, you can believe in vain. You can receive the grace of God in vain. God's grace is there. But the grace leads you to a repentant life, a life that is changed. Things are different for me now. But you get somebody and they believe in vain. They say, well, I can just believe and I can continue with... You don't understand the grace of God for you. You don't understand what Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection was all about on the cross. You have no concept of that. That's why you continue in your wickedness. Your heart is becoming hardened. You receive the grace of God in vain. You think, well, God hasn't dropped me dead yet. You know, I went to, I go to my little church building someplace and whatever else, and, and God's so good to me, you know, everything else. You're receiving God's grace in vain. You're looking at your prosperous life and it cracks me up i've seen false professing christians they live exactly like the lost world and they say i have god's blessings why well, how do you know that well because my house got rebuilt because um we had a big fire and we had to fight with the insurance company for a while and god finally answered our prayers and we got a good check from the insurance company <laughs> that was god's blessing uh no that's an insurance policy okay <laughs> that's not god's blessing it's not some miraculous thing that you, you were able to beat the insurance company. Now you got to rebuild your house. And I'm not, I'm not joking. I knew of a situation like that, you know, where people claim that it was God's blessing that they finally beat the insurance company and got paid. <laughs> well, there's lost people that do the same thing. I don't think, you know, you wouldn't call that God's blessing, but you're somehow blessed of the Lord. It doesn't make any sense. All right. What's going on there? They're receiving the grace of God in vain. A lot of people receive the grace of God in vain. God's good to them. God's patient. He's long-suffering, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And they mistake that grace for, oh, I'm saved, I'm a Christian. They receive His grace in vain. But look at verse 2. For He saith, I have heard thee in a time accepted, and in the day of salvation have I secured thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Now that verse has been used by myself and by many preachers down through the years as a to show the urgency of salvation. Friend, you don't know what will happen. You might die tomorrow. You could die in a car accident on the way home. You have no idea. Now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. Don't put it off another day. And that's good. It's good. It's, that's great preaching. You can use it that way. 
But I believe that there's another inter interpretation that's not the necessarily the urgency of salvation, but rather the, uh, how can I even say it? You better get saved today. You just heard the gospel. What happens when somebody hears the gospel clear, clearly presented and they say, not ready yet, no thank you, I still have to hold on to my sin? You say, well, okay, you said no this time, but we'll try again. Um, no, it doesn't work that way. You see, they heard the gospel, if it's been clearly presented, and they say, I'm not ready yet. The reality of it is, in God's sight, you've rejected Jesus Christ. And now the process of you hardening your heart starts. And now your life starts to go downhill. And I've seen that. Now, it might go 30, 40, 50, 60 years out into the future. I've seen old men that uh, rejected the gospel way back when they were teenagers or when they were in their early 20s. They rejected it, and they've just been living a life that's been going like this. Just downhill for years and years. And they get more hardened in their heart. And I've tried to witness to some of those older guys. Yeah, I know, I, I know, I know the Bible says, I know, I, I know, I know. You're going to get saved? I don't know. I, I, I. You know what the problem is? Hardened heart. I'll share two, ex two examples, two stories for you. Um, of people, two men that I met years ago that I believe actually could not get saved. They had reached that point where they had hardened their heart. They rejected the gospel. They said, no, deceitfulness of sin. I want that sin. I'm done. No, thank you. Um, first guy, a brother and I, we were out going door to door, and uh, there was an older man outside, and we went up and we said, you know, asked him the typical Baptist door-to-door -door questions. Uh, Hello, sir, we're out here in the neighborhood today asking people if they were to die today, do you, do you know for sure where you would go, heaven or hell? Do you know? And the guy said, he just looked at us just straight with a serious face, and he said, I would go to hell. And we said, uh, well, we both kind of, because normally they never answer that way. It's usually, oh, I think I'd probably go to heaven. I, I think maybe I would. I hope I would. And they'll smile. And he just real somber and he said I'd go to hell and we said well uh, sir would you know why do you think that he said um, I made a lot of decisions in my life and he said uh, I'm going to hell I know I am and we said well we could show you the way to get to heaven we you know held our Bibles we said we you know we can show you how to get to heaven he said no you don't understand it's too late for me he said I have a granddaughter and I'm worried about her but he said uh, it's too late for me. I can't get saved. And we said, well, sir, you don't understand. He said, no. He said, look, I understand what you're trying to do. I understand that you care about me, that you want to see me get saved. But he said, you don't understand the situation. I can't get saved. It's too late. But sir, I'm not talking anymore about it. Good day. Please go on. And if we would have pressed it further, he would have just walked right into the house and slammed the door in our faces. That's case number one. Case number two was at uh, Liberty Baptist Church in Ephrata, Pennsylvania. And we were there doing some kind of little children's thing on a Saturday, practicing for some, you know, little special Sunday thing where they would sing whatever in front of the church, the, the youth, you know, thing and whatever. And I was there, you know, with my suit and tie on and everything, my Bible. We had gone out door to door, I think, earlier, and we were doing the children's youth day thing or something. And um, I see this guy, and he comes walking in the back of the church. And he just walks in, and he's looking around like this. And I walked back to him, and I said, Hi, how are you doing? Uh, I've been better. And I said, uh, Can I help you with something? And he said, I just wanted to see this place one more time before I die. And I said, oh, excuse me? I said, I, he said, uh, yeah, he said, I'm, I'm dying of cancer. And he said, I, I, uh, I'm going to be dead probably in about a month. And the guy looked 
horrible. I mean, it looked like walking death. And he said, I used to come here as a boy, and, um, and I just wanted to come here and see it one more time. And I said, oh, I said, well, Lord, I said, are you born again? Are you saved? He said, no, I'm not. He said, I'm actually going to be going to hell. And um, that's just the way it is. And I said, well, uh, you know, I can talk to you about that. I said, you know, I can show you from the Bible. He said, no, you don't understand. Same thing. You don't understand. And I said, but sir, I said, uh, you know, Jesus Christ died for sinners. He said, I, I know. I know all the scriptures. I've heard it. I've heard the gospel. You don't understand. He said, I rejected. There's no more, there's no more chance for me. I said, well, but there always is a chance. You're still alive, aren't you? You know, I don't want to talk about it. And about that time, the pastor's son walked over and he started trying to talk to the guy. <clears throat> talk to the guy. I guess he was listening in on some of our conversation. He walks over, starts trying, and the guy finally just said, hey, I know you guys both care. I know what you're trying to do, but you don't understand. And he said, okay, see you. And he turned around and he walked out. There was not a thing I could do. I mean, I couldn't have tackled the guy and held him down on the ground and you will get saved or something. There's nothing I could do. I mean, those were two times I've had in person. But there have been multiple times uh, online in the comments, and I explain the gospel plainly, and I've seen people in the comments and they say, I don't understand. I, I just, I can't, there's something blocking me. I can't seem to make this happen. As much as I'd like to be saved, I don't, there's just something there. I can't get saved. And I've written back and forth with some of these people. You know, do you believe that Jesus died for your sins? Well, yes, I do, but uh, there's nothing there. I don't feel that I'm saved. I don't, I don't, it's like I'm, I'm blocked or something and whatever. Well, I think quite frankly, those people, they're, they've been hardened. Their heart's hardened. And the Lord's saying, you rejected me. Knew another brother, a graduate of PBI. And I used to correspond with him quite a bit. And uh, his dad, um, tough old man, and and uh, he went in and he was at his dad's be bedside. And his dad had some kind of you know quadruple bypass surgery or something like that, and and he was dying. And he's there on his on his in his deathbed, and his son there, you know, he's a pastor and the whole deal, you know, and things and and uh, strong house church preaching, you know, actually pastored a Baptist church and then left because he saw what the scriptures said and he left for that reason. And I was doing things the right way. He was a good man. And he said he's sitting there beside his dad's bedside and he said, Dad, you know, let me read you the scriptures. And he read him the scriptures and he said, Jesus died for your sin, Dad. Do you understand that? And he said, yes, I do. And he said, do you believe that he died for your sins? Do you, would you be willing to put your faith in Jesus Christ? And he said, I can't. He said, sorry, son, I, I, I can't. He said, why not, Dad? I, he said, I don't understand. He said, I don't know, son, I just, I can't. I can't do it. Knew an old farmer uh, many years ago, raised by a, a mother that loved the Lord, but he rejected. He just rejected the gospel down through the years. He talked to that man about the Lord and, yeah, yeah, I know, I know, I know. You know, going to get saved? I don't know. I, I, don't, I don't know. Hardened hearts. You see, Second Corinthians chapter six, verse two. Now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. I don't think it's 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 fine to use it as an evangelistic type of thing, but but quite frankly, I think it's a doctrinal thing. Um. When you hear the gospel, you better respond to it now. You hear a sermon from a preacher. If you're lost and you're watching this and you're hearing me say that Jesus died for your sins, he was buried, and he rose again from the dead the third day according to the scriptures. That's not like Muhammad or Buddha or whatever else. So what separates Christianity from the others? Well, our Savior, we serve a risen Savior. He died, he was buried, and he rose from the dead. All right? He shed his blood on the cross to pay for your sins, to wash them all away. And all you have to do is just come to him and be honest. I'm a sinner. He died on the cross for sinners. You're a sinner. You see how that works? I believe Jesus' death on the cross is enough to pay for my sins. 
I want a new life. I don't care what it costs me. I don't care if my buddies make fun of me at work or whatever else. See? You call upon the name of the Lord to be saved. You pray and you say, God, I need to be saved. In your own words, however you need to say that. God, I've messed up my life. I've, I've done so many horrible things. You know what all I've done. And if I had to stand before you right now, I'd go to hell. I don't want to go to hell, Lord. I know that why you died on the cross. I know why. Because you died for rotten sinners like me. God, I need a new life. My life is a wreck. I'm tired of this life. God, would you please save me? Please, Lord, I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. You pray something along those lines. You put your faith truly in Jesus Christ. And you feel the Holy Spirit move into you. And all of a sudden you have a lust for truth. It's just you can't stop it. And you're just saying, I want to know about this. And I want to know about that. And I, I oh. And all of a sudden people are starting to say, what happened to you? You're, you something's weird about you. What's wrong with you? What? Uh, what? You don't have my dirty jokes anymore. Hey, man, why aren't you smoking? You want to come down to the bar? You don't go to the bar anymore? You don't like the rock music that we listen to? Man, we listened to this stuff for years. What's wrong with you? No, I'm born again now. New creature in Christ Jesus. But if you hear the gospel and you say, I, no. Don't think I'm interested. Um, you just rejected Jesus Christ. And now your heart starts to get harder as time goes by. You see, the fact is, as a preacher, I can't really tell when somebody has reached that point of their heart being hardened. I can't look at somebody and say, uh oh, uh, look at that. I can see their heart is hardened. I don't know. I've talked to people, the different cases I talked about there, I believe their hearts were hardened. But when you come right down to it, it's between them and God. That's what it's really between. So my job as a preacher is to preach the gospel to every creature. I can't say, um, if you're here today and you think that you might have a hardened heart, could you please go outside for a little bit? I, you know, I don't want to preach to you. I don't want to waste my time. <laughs> Hey, if you're, if you're watching this video and your heart has been hardened, please shut the video off. Don't, you know, pay attention. I don't know. That's between you and God. But let me just say this. If you're lost and you're rejecting this right now, you're heading for your heart being hardened. And you better stop whatever you're doing right now if you want heaven when you die and not hell. Not an eternity in hell burning forever. Um, you better stop what you're doing and get down on your knees and say, God, I'm sorry. Different times I heard the gospel in the past. I didn't, I'm not going to make excuses for it. Maybe I didn't understand exactly or whatever. I'm ready for salvation right now. God, please save me. And I don't care if I lose my marriage, my home, my job, my friends, whatever. It's all on the altar, Lord. Please take me. Please save me. And if you go, well, I, I keep messing around. And someday that lost person, you lost person, I don't know what to do. I just, I, I, I can't. I, God won't save you. God's love for you is not unconditional. Okay? Uh, never fall for that lie that's uh, spewed out by the modern Christians, out the modern churches and things, because they're after your money. That's the whole case. Uh, God's love for you is unconditional. He's ready to accept you whenever you want. No, He isn't. He doesn't say whenever is the accepted time. Ah, whenever you feel like it's the day of salvation. Uh, now. Now. Um, hey, I, I just got a, a shot. I have a bullet wound and I'm bleeding. When do you need help? Well, I'll get to it eventually. You're bleeding out. You're losing blood. You're going to be dead in a matter of minutes. Well, yeah, you know, it's not so good, but uh, well, I'll, I, I think it'll work out. No, no, help me now. Please, I'm dying. I need help. The wages of sin is death. It's my advice to you if you're lost. You say, what about a saved man or a woman? Um, you're going to run into people, brethren, 
who have hardened their heart. Do you have any relatives that have hardened their hearts? I do. My decision's been made. Don't talk to me anymore about that. I don't want to hear it. Yep, yeah, okay. I've heard this stuff before, Brian. Shut up. Okay? Do you think you're right and everybody else is wrong? Whatever whatever. I'm I'm worried about you and think all the stuff that they say, they've hardened their heart. What can I do? Well, maybe if I come back in and kind of sugarcoat the gospel, maybe I don't have to, maybe I, I shouldn't be quite as hard on the King James only issue. Maybe I shouldn't be quite as hard on this and shouldn't. No, I'm going to preach the book as it stands. And you do the same. Don't you ever compromise. But, you know, maybe I can get a good false conversion in and, and then I'll feel better about myself. And I'll be able to go hang out with my family again. Go hang out with my friends if I don't bring up Jesus all the time. No. If they're going to harden their hearts, then uh, there isn't anything you can do about that. And if you've clearly presented the gospel to relatives, and those relatives just, no, no, no. Stop wasting your time. Stop wasting your time. Let's be frank about it. There's other people out there that need to be saved. Other people that would respond, now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. You want to get saved? Here it is. The gospel. Let me give it to you. So that's going to be it for this study. Um, if you haven't met any yet, uh, you will. Um, there's a lot of people out there that have heart in their hearts. And uh, not much you can do for them. Um, if you're lost, you skip the forward to the end. Uh, boy, you better get saved. Because the first time that you reject the gospel, the first time you say, no, I'm not ready yet, um, the process of you hardening your heart and where God goes along with it, you know, hey, God, God knows my heart. Yes, he does. Think about that. Um, God knows my heart. God looks down and he sees it hardening and he says, let me help you out with that process. You like your sin, do you? Oh, here's some more. There's some more. Are you convinced that you're a sinner yet? Oh, no, not yet. I'll just make that heart a little bit harder. You get to a point where you might be in your deathbed and, God, what do I do? I don't know what to do. God just says, uh, I don't hear anything. I've heard the deathbed confessions. Catholics on their deathbed screaming and crying and saying, I'm going to hell. I know I'm going to hell. I don't know what to do. You harden your heart all your life. Now when you want God, He doesn't want you. you. Better take heed. When the Bible says now is the accepted time, now is the day of salvation, you better get saved as soon as you hear it. That's going to be it. Please get your salvation worked out if you haven't already. If you are saved, uh, don't worry yourself over people that have rejected the gospel. Okay? Um, it's between them and God. Witness to people? Certainly. Be there. But if you presented the gospel clearly to them and they reject and they said, I've made my decision, go help somebody else. Don't waste time on those people. It's going to be it. Thank you for watching.